Hey everyone, my last video brought forth a lot of questions and comments about restoring Redline Hot Wheels. I've tried to answer as many as I could, but thought that making another video would be much easier than trying to explain things one person at a time. I'm going to try in this video to show every step to help those who would like to give customizing old red lines a try. I chose a silhouette for this video. I assumed when I first saw the silhouette that it was one of the first fantasy cars Mattel had made. But actually this is a real car scratch built by Bill Cushenberry in 1963. It was a fully working concept car and can be seen in the movie Beach Ball that came out in 1965. This diecast version is in pretty poor shape and was sent to me by a viewer. A good portion of its paint is gone and corrosion has set in. It's going to take some work to get this one back into shape, so let's get started. When you turn this car over, you'll notice two rivets. Some cars have more, some have less. Using a number 50 drill bit, I'll start drilling a hole in the center of the rivet. In modern cars, this is much easier as the rivets are not flat like the ones on these old red lines. I will go ahead and drill down past the point of the body. I have the drill bit out way too far right now so you can see what I'm doing. These small drill bits break very easily so normally I have the drill bit inside the chuck as far as possible to limit movement and to keep from breaking the drill bit. Once I have the hole drilled out, I can then use a drill bit slightly smaller than the head of the rivet to remove the head. Take care here and go really slow as you can easily mess up the base of the car if you go too far. Once I have one of the rivets out, I'll turn the car over and do the same to the other. So here's what it looks like once you have successfully removed the rivet heads. I usually use a small tool, sometimes my fingernail, to pry the two sides apart. Using the same drill bit as before, I'll go ahead and drill down a little further now that I can see the whole post. Once I get down about halfway, I stop and then use a 2-56 tap to tap the post. Diecast has problems gumming up taps, so you'll need to rotate the tap often so it can clear the debris. Otherwise, you will likely break your very delicate tap. Okay, so now the posts have been drilled and tapped and the car is apart. Now is when I really go over the car and make sure it's worth restoring. Sometimes you open up a car only to find the internal parts have been broken or the axles have been rusted through. This car seems to be in okay shape. It uses a non-removable wire suspension I really hate though. It's difficult to fix these axles as they are independent and each wire can move in place. You bend the wire and think you have everything set only to find out that the wire can rotate inside the post and the wheel is now in the wrong place but we'll deal with that here in a bit. Speaking of the wheels, let's go ahead and cut these off. I use this tool for removing the wheels. I don't know what it's actually called, so I call them nippers. A lot of people gave me flack in the last video for calling them that, but nobody gave me the official name. Anyway, you just grab a hold of the wheels just above the white plastic bearing and squeeze. Off goes the wheel. As I've said in other videos, you must cut the wheels off because pulling them off can damage the plastic bearing. To fix the wire axles, I'll use a small axle repair tool you can buy online from websites like redlineshop.com. I'll be leaving links to all the tools that I'm using below in the description. To use this tool, you place the wire in the small notch at the top of the tool and then bend the wire in the direction you want. It's a great tool and makes bending these wires much easier. Once the axles were where I think they should be, I'll use some masking tape to cover the plastic bearings. I'm going to remove the paint, and the paint stripper I used could destroy the plastic bearings if they weren't masked off. To remove the paint, I use this aircraft paint remover you can buy at any auto parts store. This stuff is great and makes quick work of the paint on modern and vintage Hot Wheels. I usually let it set for 5 minutes, but most of the time it works almost immediately. And yes, we have chickens wandering around. To remove the paint stripper, I use a soft wire brush, but pretty much anything will work. Even running the car under water will remove the paint.
So in the custom Camaro video, I used a chemical polishing method to remove the corrosion. This time I'm not going to mess with all that and go with sandpaper. 600 grit to be specific. I cut the sandpaper in small strips to allow for better control. The silhouette is a great car to learn on. There aren't any panel lines to worry about sanding out, and usually the silhouette can be had for a few bucks, so no big loss if you mess up. For hard to reach places, I use sanding needles bought from the hobby store. These are great for areas that I can't reach with the sandpaper. So here's the car after I've sanded it down. Now I'm starting to get a little bit worried at this point because I've noticed discoloration in the metal all over the car. This happens on these old cars and usually can't be sanded out. I'm going to polish it and get a better idea of how bad the discoloration is. To polish the car I use a buffing wheel and buffing compound. The compounds come in different abrasives and this black one is coarse. You can buy these compounds at home improvement stores like Lowe's. This will remove the scratches left by the 600 grit sandpaper. When I'm done going over the car with this compound, I will switch to the wheel on the other side of the buffer and use a green compound, which is a fine grit and will remove the small scratches put in by the black compound. So as you can see, after polishing this car, the discoloration issue is pretty bad. The car has to be in the right light to see it, but some of the metal is darker than the surrounding metal. I don't think it's a corrosion issue because I can polish it. Normally if I see this I can get around the issue by painting the car a darker color like blue or purple. However I want to paint this car back to its original color yellow. Yellow and pink are the worst at hiding issues with the underlying metal. I decided though to go ahead and paint it yellow and not to hide it. My reasoning for this is that I get a lot of people telling me to use primers and other gap filling solutions to fix surface issues like pits and scratches. My response to them has always been that you can't use anything that can't be polished because the paint is transparent and the spectroflame effect relies on the shiny metal underneath. So I will leave in this discoloration issue and let's see if the discoloration can be seen through the paint the same way I think a primer or filler would. As I said before, I plan to paint this car yellow. I use paint from redlineshop.com. I'm not affiliated with them at all, I just really like their products. Some of the paints like this yellow paint need to be shaken really well as there is some sort of material in them that settles out. I assume this material gives the paint its unique sparkly look when you see the car in direct light. I spray the paint on using a cheap airbrush that I only use for spectroflame paints. These paints are about as thin as water and clean up easily with paint thinner. I use small pipettes to measure out the paint and add it to the airbrush. I typically use one pipette full of paint to paint one car. Since this car needs its base painted too, I will add another pipette full later. Using another pipette, I will add 20 drops of hardener to the airbrush and mix the paint. This is my personal ratio for paint to hardener. The hardener makes this paint bulletproof. When this stuff fully cures, it's very difficult to even sand it off. I'm painting this car in a large cardboard box that I've installed a squirrel cage fan to and installed lights in. I have a much nicer airbrush booth inside my house, but you don't want to spray this urethane paint indoors without a setup that can remove all the paint fumes. The large vent in the back is attached to a fan which sucks all the air in the box outside. This is not optional if you decide to try painting these cars. For obvious health reasons, like the fact that you don't want your lungs covered up in urethane, you must remove all the fumes from this paint. A very light first coat is applied and allowed to dry, and then subsequent coats are added, each time allowing for a little more paint to be applied. I stop applying coats when the tone looks correct. Sometimes this takes 10 coats, other times it takes 30. It depends a lot on what color you're applying. So after everything cures, here's how the paint turned out. The Spectroflame paint looks like it's supposed to with that crystal-like faceted surface. A lot of times I will clear coat over the top of this, but I never do that for yellow. 
Plus, the temperature is too low and can cause orange peel, something I thought I might get away with in the last video. If you look closely, you can see the discoloration through the paint. The light has to be right, but it's still there. This is why I don't think filling the pits and scratches with material will work. A lot of people talk about using solder to fill pits and scratches. Believe me, I have tried to solder these cars multiple times. It simply does not work with anything I have tried. None of the solder bonds to the metal or even flows onto it. If you have an idea of how to make it work, let me know below. Okay, so let's move on to the other parts of the car. The oval windshield is in pretty good shape with only a couple nicks and scratches. To fix this, I will use rubbing compound. If the nicks and scratches are deep, you can use 2000 grit sandpaper to sand them all out and then use 3000 grit to remove the 2000 grit scratches and then use rubbing compound. I have a video detailing this if you're interested. Using testers enamel, I will use a small brush to paint in the tail light of this car. The motor of this car has lost its vacuum metalized coating and is now showing the black plastic below. I will fix this using some chrome paint made by Valspar. This is one of the best chrome paints out there in my opinion. Of course, it can't duplicate the shiny surface, but on a small high detailed item like this motor, it comes pretty darn close. All right, so the last detail is to put on the new wheels. I bought these wheels from redlineshop.com. I used the axle tool from earlier to act as a spacer between the car body and the plastic bearing. This stops the bearing from moving back when you try to put the wheels on. After the wheels are installed, I spent more time adjusting the axles to compensate for the play in the bearings. The bearings become loose in these old cars with play and time. As you can see, the wheels can move around a lot without moving the axle given the play in the bearing. There's not much you can really do about this short of replacing everything. Not something I'll be doing on this particular silhouette. So now we have all the parts restored and we can put the car back together. A lot of people asked in the custom Camaro video about the value of restoring one of these cars. Does it remove value? Does it add value? How much do these cars sell for? Well, as far as removing and adding value, it really depends on the condition and the original price of the car. If you buy a $175 car and restore it, the price of your restored car will go down dramatically, even if it looks a thousand times better. On the other hand, if you buy a junker for a few bucks and then restore it, the price goes up. Of course, restored cars go for a small fraction of what their mint twins go for. I collect both original cars and junker cars that I restore. I have a restored Sweet 16 set that altogether probably costs less than my mint silhouette. And this is why I like restoring cars. It's not that I'm trying to make money on them. It's to keep me from spending money on them. If I can get a $4 car to look like a $400 car, then it would be difficult to justify spending that $400. The silhouette I restored here is still an original silhouette. It was made with all the others in 1968, played with like all the others. All I change is its appearance. If you are someone who would like to own the original 16 Hot Wheels in near mint shape without spending $4,000 or more, well, restored cars are your friend because you can usually get a restored version of a car under $75, depending on the model and how much work was put into it. And if you do it yourself, it's even cheaper. I restore these cars because I'm passionate about them, not because I'm trying to get rich off of them. I hope this video has been helpful and answered some of the questions that people have asked. This video is not really about this particular restoration as much as it is about the showing parts of the process I tend to leave out in past videos due to time and perceived boredom my viewers would probably endure if I put this info in every restoration video I make. If you have any other questions, please put them below. Anyways, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.